magically come together to create the clear image of a face. The part of your brain that flips this switch from confusion to clarity has been called the fusiform face area, or FFA for short. It also happens to be a part of the brain that does not work properly in Chuck Close. The artist has a severe form of a disorder called prosopagnosia, which in his case is a hereditary condition that makes it extremely difficult to recognize faces, even his own. In fact, according to Close, the reason he paints faces in his signature style is because it's the only way he can make sense of them. In interviews, he explains that he recognizes real faces by systematically breaking them down into smaller and smaller quadrants in a grid. So the artist paints what he perceives. So with this in mind, let me ask you a question. What do you think is the genetic function of the FFA? Do you think it's designed to process faces specifically, or do you think it could serve a more general function, like processing any type of meaningful visual information? Throughout this lecture, we'll come back to this question because the answer is key to understanding how humans learn language and many other things throughout their development. But before we jump in, let me just briefly set up this section of the course. In the next group of five lectures, we'll be talking about the developmental time frame. Using the 3D framework, you'll see how language and the mind emerge from an interaction of developmental and evolutionary mechanisms. By the end of this section, you'll be ready for yet another set of lectures in which we will discuss how all this comes together in the brain to help us understand and use language from one moment to the next. To introduce the scientific study of human development, we need to briefly build up some philosophical foundation for the big issues. Probably the biggest issue concerns the age-old question of nature and nurture. Historically, these have been treated as black or white options. Either you're born with what you need to know about the world, or you have to learn it from experience. The nature side of the equation can be traced back to many philosophical traditions, but probably the best known comes from ancient Greek philosophy. Plato, in particular, is credited with being one of the earliest Western philosophers to embrace a view of innate knowledge. In one of his most famous dialogues, Socrates has a conversation with an uneducated boy named Meno. Socrates demonstrates with a series of questions that Meno knows a lot more about mathematical concepts than his lack of education would suggest. Plato uses this dialogue to demonstrate that we're all born with knowledge of certain capital T truths that simply need to be unlocked or recollected, to use Plato's terms, by experiencing certain triggers in the environment. In this way, acquiring knowledge of these fundamental truths is not so much the result of the brain learning as it is the soul remembering. The competing nurture view also has a deep history. Although he is often ignored in the West, the Chinese philosopher Confucius, who predated Plato by over a century, stressed the importance of learning, especially through parent-child interactions. In fact, the most fundamental Confucian value filial piety, or respect for elders, is built on these early family dynamics. In his most famous work, The Analects, it was all about the importance of learning these basic virtues, suggesting that much of what we know is not innate within us, but must be acquired through discipline, practice, and education. By far, the most famous Western philosopher associated with the nurture position is John Locke. We talked about Locke a bit in the first lecture, and his idea of the tabula rasa is the quintessential nurture position. We're born with blank slates, and it's our experience that fills them in. Now, both philosophical extremes have carried a legacy into modern-day linguistics, neuroscience, and psychology. You're already familiar with some of the most prominent supporters of the nature position, such as Noam Chomsky and Steven Pinker, and they clearly owe a debt to Plato. And on the nurture side are the behaviorists of the mid-20th century, such as the psychologists B.F. Skinner and John Watson, and the physiologist Ivan Pavlov. They believe that almost everything we are is learned through direct interactions with the environment, making them the clear intellectual descendants of John Locke. 
These extreme positions have given way to a much more balanced view. It's now commonly accepted that the human mind is the result of both nature and nurture. And the origins of this philosophical view are a direct reaction to John Locke's tabula rasa metaphor. The great German philosopher, Gottfried Leibniz, likened our minds at birth to a block of unshaped marble containing natural veins that would naturally influence how much the marble would react when it was struck by a hammer and chisel. Because each block of marble has a unique pattern of veins, it makes it easier for certain shapes to be formed and harder for others. In this way, we are the product of some innate predispositions that interact with environmental influences. This is essentially the, the position that most scientists take today. Though the marble and hammer analogy, it's a bit rough. It captures the basic idea pretty well. But current theories are much more specific and dynamic. The most exciting questions now in developmental psychology and neuroscience are concerned with determining exactly what is built into humans at birth and how and when those things interact with the environment throughout development. To guide us in addressing these questions, we'll borrow from one of my favorite little books on child development, The Scientist in the Crib. I highly recommend it if you have a young child or grandchild, or if you're just fascinated by kids. It's written by three leaders in the field of developmental psychology, Allison Gopnik at UC Berkeley, and Andrew Meltzoff and Patricia Kuhl at the University of Washington. The book takes a very similar approach as our 3D framework, and it outlines three major mechanisms that drive development. The big three are, one, innate knowledge, two, powerful learning tools, and three, unconscious tuition from others. The first and the third best correspond to the classic nature-nurture dichotomy, and the middle one serves as a bridge between the two. Let's focus on them in order. When developmental psychologists speak of innate knowledge, they're talking about the baggage that humans have accumulated over the course of evolution that they bring to personal development. Everyone agrees that we bring some innate knowledge, but there's vigorous debate about the nature of this knowledge. On one hand, there's the domain general view, which we've already discussed. Domain general knowledge refers to built-in abilities that are very broad and can be applied to many different domains. In the case of language, we've already discussed some likely candidates, like pattern recognition and perspective taking. These skills can be applied to any number of domains. The other type of innate knowledge is domain-specific knowledge, which is something that is innately specified for a very particular function. A machine analogy makes this position clear. The brakes of a car are in place to do one thing and only one thing, to reduce speed. That's their sole purpose. And if you think of humans as biological machines, organs like the heart have a domain-specific function. Its day and night job is to pump blood through the body. The domain-specific functions of biological organs are pretty clear, but when it comes to the cognitive and social aspects of the mind, things get much more complicated. The most promising domains that are candidates for innately specified functions are those that have been key for our survival for the longest time over evolution. For example, Elizabeth Spelke of Harvard argues that babies are born with some innate core knowledge about fundamentally important cognitive abilities, such as differentiating one object from many and understanding basic physical properties of the world, like gravity. The idea is that because these abilities are so fundamentally important to survival, babies need a head start on knowing about these specific things. As I said, this is a very contentious area of research. There are other aspects of the mind that were once thought to be domain specific, but that now seem to be domain general. This is where face processing comes in. Back to my question about the FFA. Do you think it's designed to process faces specifically or do you think it serves a more, a more general function? Well, most researchers now believe that the FFA serves a more domain general function at birth. Evidence for this comes from clues on multiple levels of analysis and different time frames. Here are two clues for now. 
First, although research does show that babies have a clear preference for faces over other objects at a very early age, in some cases just a few days old, it's not clear that the preference is for human faces per se. For example, compared to objects, babies also look longer at animal faces, such as those of monkeys. From this, would you really want to conclude that there is an innate domain-specific ability for humans to recognize and prefer monkey faces? That doesn't seem right. And taking faces out of the picture completely, it's interesting that when it comes to objects, babies look longer at ones that are symmetric than they do than those that are asymmetric. These findings suggest that a more general mechanism, such as symmetry detection, might drive our early preference for faces. The second piece of evidence comes from neuroimaging studies on infants. Recall the, the fMRI technique I mentioned in the last lecture? Well, innovations in the field have adapted that te technique to study face perception in very young infants. For example, Rebecca Sachs and her team at MIT investigated brain activation of babies as young as four months old when viewing images of faces versus natural scenes. They were looking at areas along the visual processing stream, which extends from the back of the occipital lobe where visual processing starts downward to the temporal lobe. At the end of this visual pathway is the FFA. In adults, the FFA is highly active when viewing faces compared to other objects. If that were also the case with very young infants, it would suggest that perhaps the FFA is genetically programmed for processing faces at birth. But the results suggested otherwise. Although there were large-scale brain areas that differentiated faces and scenes, it was not localized in the FFA like it is in, the, in adults. One interpretation of these findings is that early visual processing uses a larger swath of the brain, and only with more experience during development does the FFA take on a more focused and specialized role. In other words, it seems that the brain must undergo some significant changes in order for the FFA to become specialized for processing faces. How is this specialization possible? The answer leads us to Gopnik, Meltzoff, and Kuhl's second mechanism of development, powerful learning tools. One way to think about innate knowledge is in terms of a head start or a nudge in a particular direction. These nudges are either very specific, a preference for faces, or very general, a preference for symmetry.